period of time, uh, her and her sister lived in the same house that uh, Stalin's henchmen uh, killed Porter Trotsky. But anyway, he came to the United States and uh, has a specialty in brain imaging in relates to substance abuse. So anyway, um, so I, I drew on that and Here's a quick overview of the theme that I'm gonna present is the longstanding tension between commercial interests and effective public policy. You guess they're, they push in different directions. Um, look at some prevention definitions, assumptions and risk factors, and then trends in public policies related to alcohol, nicotine, Opioids uh, and marijuana can't leave out alcohol and nicotine. You know, it's just not possible to have a credible uh, presentation having to do with substance misuse without looking at the two biggest, uh, what are still, even with the opioid, there's still a biggest issue. And then finally, uh, harm reduction. And then a time for questions and discussion afterwards. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question for clarification. Um, but what I'd like to do is leave any discussion uh, towards, towards the end. So, who can tell us about what substance use prevention is? We get some clarity from Aristotle. And what I appreciate about his clarity is he made a distinction between real goods and apparent goods or fake goods. And what's a real good? A real good is something that helps us fulfill our natures as human beings. So what is that? Well, in, and I think in general terms that most people can agree with, it has to do with being a participant in the community, being a part of the community, um, involved in work, involved in friendships and health. And so to me then the definition of prevention, okay, and then the fake goods are just the opposite. Things that appear to be good, but turn out to hinder our ability to be part of the community, to thrive, to have good relationships and health. So prevention then is, as I see it, to help people choose health over the fake good of substance misuse. So why go into that? Isn't that kind of what everybody believes? Um, well, there are different opinions and different views of, of that. This is from a Canadian safe supply staff member. Beginning in the pandemic, several provinces in Canada uh, gave permission to physicians to uh, prescribe uh, heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine, et cetera, to uh, individuals with the idea that it would be better for them to get a clean supply of the drugs. This uh, person that I'm quoting though has an, an extension of that and says, views that there is a human right, okay? Uh, providing mind altering drugs is an extension of human rights, the right to have fun, okay? Um, and that's very different of course, from what it is to be uh, in the community especially with these drugs. It's just not possible to use heroin on a regular basis, fentanyl, and I'm not talking about the patch, but fentanyl uh, with these drugs that have short durations of actions, high peak effect and down, you just can't function with that, uh, those things. And so at first I thought, well, uh, this is a libertarian view and come to find out on further analysis, it isn't because by describing it as a human right, that somebody might have who is unable to earn a living or support themselves, the implication then would be that it then is an obligation of society to support that. Anyway, this is an idea gaining some steam in Canada and on the West Coast. Um, and so looking further for a counter to Aristotle, I looked at the Cato Institute, okay? and came across this, the recommendation from the Cato Institute. And the, it's a recommendation to accept the legalization, decriminalization and harm reduction strategies adopted by the Netherlands, 
Portugal and Uruguay. I looked at that and thought, well, I'll be there. What that recommendation is really is the mainstream of what public policy people in the field of substance abuse would endorse. Okay? There is some issues, though, in how it's translated into the United States. And I will use Portugal as a quick example. In 2001, uh, Portugal was having a terrible problem with heroin overdose. So they made a decision to decriminalize personal possession of all drugs. And they, in loose terms, defined that as a 10-day supply. And then the way it worked was that if you were caught with, you know, the drugs are still illegal, by the way. They're illegal everywhere in Europe. Uh, that's by treaty through the European Union. But with this decriminalization, if you were caught within the parameters that they established, about a 10-day supply, uh, what would happen is that um, you, you would be uh, sent with an appointment with a drug panel made up of, among others, health experts. They would assess you, and they would determine if you were, uh, had a substance use disorder, at which point you were recommended to go into treatment, and there would be feedback. and um, if you were just a recreational user, you'd be hit with a fine. It would be a pretty substantial fine. But anyway, that's how decriminalization worked. And they had really excellent access to treatment, okay? Here's what happened in Oregon. Um, in 2020, Oregon passed, uh, using what I believe is Orwellian language, the Substance Abuse Treatment and Recovery Act. And that was supposed to be modern, uh, uh, modeled on Portugal, but it turned out to be different. So what happens if you get caught with what is defined as a personal supply? Well, you get a ticket, like in, in Portugal. You have a number to call for an assessment. If you call the number, your fine is waived. If you don't call the number, your case is dismissed, and that's it, okay? And so, essentially, uh, what they did was come up with a way of decriminalizing drugs without providing access to care, okay? Um, just as a footnote, I saw recently data from the uh, Center for Disease Control that looked at the um, trend in opioid overdose, and it looks like nationally it may be, uh, maybe, leveling out. Now, before we celebrate, it would be leveling out at extremely high levels, okay? In Oregon, in the past 12 months, uh, overdose deaths have increased 29%, okay? So these are the things that I think the experts recommend and Cato recommends and all of that, but it's a lot in how it's done. According to Keith Humphreys, the guy I mentioned from Stanford, he sees the difference this way. In Portugal, um, drug use is stigmatized, okay? They, they, there is a negative perception to people using drugs, and they have excellent access to care. Uh, what's happening in some West Coast cities is that it's accepted. It's okay. Drug use is okay. What the hell, okay? So anyway, uh, hence the, these different uh, philosophies. Then there's always the issue of freedom. Let me put it this way, and it echoes a discussion with people were sharing their war stories about nicotine, right, uh, that we had over, over uh, a dinner. That is addiction, if we're gonna talk about freedom, freedom to use, freedom to advertise, all of that, we gotta recognize addiction is a profound loss of freedom. Okay, here's what CDC uh, from their website says. Most people who take up smoking in short order decide, oh, the hell did I do that for, you know, and begin to want to quit. Well, it turns out that 92% of treatment attempts fail. That's the bad news. The good news is that most people eventually are able to quit it just takes a while to get the hang of recovery for most people. It may take five times, 10 times, 20 times, whatever.
But the point is this 92% um, rate is anything but freedom. And that's nicotine. Good Lord, let's look at the synthetic narcotics, uh, these, you know, methamphetamine. Those are tougher. You know, those have recovery rates lower. It's that much harder. And then we look at the opiate narcotics. Well, if people try to do it on their own cold turkey, about a 98% failure rate for time. The good news, and I'll talk more about these drugs later on, if they get the right type of medication, agonist and partial agonist treatment, methadone and buprenorphine, the outcomes are, are pretty good with those treatment drugs. Um, but still, it's not freedom. Uh, nevertheless, users are accountable. Part of it is just karma, right? Uh, you pay a price, right, uh, for being a user. The other reason about accountability is that um, people need to be, if they're ever to get well, once they get caught up or under the spell of addiction, um, they need to be held accountable for the consequences of their actions if they're ever going to be able to turn things around. One of the things I'm going to ask you to think about, I know last May there was some discussion about free speech in a different context. A lot of times you, the uh, uh, drug companies, um, the um, now the commercial marijuana people, the nicotine companies will talk about, you know, our product is legal, shouldn't we be able to advertise any way we want? Uh, what I'd like you to do is to think about Think about that as, as the presentation goes forward. Now, drug misuse, it always seems like it's the worst of times and the best of times. Things always seem like they're getting worse. Well, there's many encouraging things happening now, despite that terrible overdose epidemic. So why does it always seem things are getting worse? Well, part of it is this. Part of it is just per human perception, okay? We don't see what's not there. I'm gonna run a little experiment. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands, but a little experiment. I bet anything that none of you have noticed that I have not snorted cocaine the whole time I've been talking, right? No. You don't notice what's not there. Um, <clears throat> um, but, but you would have noticed it if I did. Um, another is, the trouble in River City approach, and here we have the guy from Music Man. There have been times when people have entered like the prevention field this way. Oh, we got trouble. Oh, we got trouble right here. And I can remember, without mentioning names, a former hockey coach that approached the schools and approached others and was talking about, well, now it's down to middle school. Now the dealers are going to middle school playgrounds and getting kids hooked. Well, back when I was a counselor, which, as I'd mentioned, it was very hard work, I did counsel some people who had, from time to time, had engaged in street-level dealing. They were pretty much a math-impaired group, um, but none of them were so math-impaired that they would see any percentage in trying to sell drugs for lunch money, okay? So some of this never happened. There's no need to exaggerate. It is what it is and it's bad enough what it is. The exaggeration is counterproductive because it tends to normalize. It's like, well, everybody's doing it, okay? That tends to make it seem more normal, uh, which encourages wider use. Uh, back in the day, our prevention specialist, Beverly Gregus, I really admired her and the work she did. She would go to schools and talk to parents, groups, and students and say, you know what? The majority of kids in this school aren't using drugs. And, you know, that's worth thinking about and talking to parents and saying the same thing. To normalize not using. Um, and the other thing is when people get discouraged is when they come up with a category of uh, solutions that I'd say, oh, to hell with it. You know, um, people are using, what can we do? Let's give them drugs. Um, so um, there is, though, some very good news. Um, those of you who had experience with parents can remember the time when you said to your kid, here's the car keys, go drive. And I don't know about you, but 
that was hard, right? And I would worry. And what would I worry about? Well, a big one is this. Now, this is not an eye test. You don't need to be able to read every detail. What this is, is high school. And it covers the period from on the horizontal axis from 1991 to 2019. The vertical axis is the number of days in the past 30 days that these high school kids, males on the left, uh, girls on the right, had driven after consuming some alcohol. And really, what I'm drawing your attention to is just the shape of the slope. It's very encouraging to see how that terrible risk has diminished and is diminishing so tremendously. Something else to point out, and I don't know how easy it is to see from where you're sitting, is that the different lines represent different ethnic groups. The red line represents African Americans. And you can see that African American high school students engage in uh, driving after drinking much less. This is sort of typical. If we look at most drugs, most of the time, at most age levels, we find that African Americans uh, use, misuse drugs more, uh, at lower rates than their white counterparts. Now, that may seem surprising, because I don't know how you can live in Kalamazoo and think that, the way drugs is, are projected onto African Americans, or the way this war on drugs in some ways focused on African Americans, despite the fact that they tended to have, and still tend to have, fewer problems. And so there are some unhelpful ways of framing it, and right at the top is projecting it on African Americans, okay? Um, obviously, the war on drugs is one extreme, okay? Mandatory minimums for X amount of cocaine, prohibition from alcohol, we go to this extreme, and then we go, oh, to hell with it, let's just give them drugs, right? Um, let me say something about the war on drugs, because some of the interest in commercializing marijuana will say things now like, well, we don't want to go along with the war on drugs. I can remember in the early 90s, um, representing the organization I was with, traveling to Miami with uh, Bob Pangle from the prosecutor's office and Judge Bill Schmay uh, looking at the drug court in Miami. And then um, we came back and the, uh, we were the primary treatment provider and the legal system put together the drug court, okay? And the drug court was aimed at getting people help. It wasn't aimed at incarcerating. Uh, and then, then there was an alcohol court and a mental health court and a juvenile court all of these things aimed at helping, not having a war on drugs. And, and, and so I would maintain that at least in Kalamazoo and much of the country, there hasn't been a war on drugs in decades, okay? Um, there's another way that I think is unhelpful, and that is, this is from New York Times. I like to listen to this, uh, uh, The Daily Show, and this was about fentanyl. And, so I wrote this down because the guy said, talked about fentanyl and said despair, bad health care outcomes, rising wealth inequality, loneliness that drive people to addiction in the first place, implying all these things have to be solved if we're going to deal with fentanyl. Good Lord. Well, number one, that's not the etiology of addiction. That's not how addiction comes apart about. This number two is very hard. I mean, we should deal with these things. Loneliness is a problem, and we should deal with them, but um, it becomes very difficult to think that we have to. There are other ways we can, uh, we can deal with it, and it's the distinction between underlying conditions or lifestyle issues versus what the researchers call proximate factors. So the underlying conditions, for example, maybe are things like loneliness, or income disparities and despair, all of that stuff. For high school kids, it's uh, according to the decades of research, some of the lifestyle issues that put kids at greater risk are things like truancy, the greater the truancy, um, 
other problems in school. It turns out that religiosity can be protective. Uh, it turns out that conventionality can be protective. So you have these list of things, right? Uh, uh, and then you have the proximate factors. The proximate factors are really clear. And I think this is true for both high school and adult. And that is um, access to the drug, okay? That's a proximate factor. A second one is uh, disapproval versus normalization, okay? And a third is perception of risk. So those are things that are proximate. Um, and so I'm gonna now be prepared, okay? Because you're about to see a slide that I have meditated on as each year goes by and it goes forward that I think is fascinating, okay? So I hope you find it fascinating too. This is from Monitoring the Future, the U of M, and it's national data. And the vertical axis is looking at high school seniors, okay, who use marijuana daily or near daily. That's the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is all the way from 74, 22, okay? So if you look at the trend, you can see it went way up back in 78, 79, 11%. Think about that. 11% of high school students were getting high most every day. It's actually daily use. They counted as 20 or more days that, that you use. Well, even with the marijuana they had back then, it's pretty hard to function getting high every day and then trying to do well in high school. But then you see this big drop off. So what happened? You know, well, that's a big question in prevention. And I think here's what happened. Okay, well, actually it's what the researchers from Michigan say happened. And that is the, uh, in high school happens to be this time when people get together in close contact, you're obsessed with where do you fit in? How are other people doing compared to you, right? There's that high school obsession. And the high school kids then looked at the kids smoking pot behind the bleachers and thought, ooh, that, they're not doing so well, right? Um, as a matter of fact, I can remember back then, um, people that I knew working in the schools locally, counselors and uh, teachers, saying how other kids would call the kids smoking pot of the, behind the bleachers, crispy critters, right? After the cereal, crispy critters. And so then what we saw associated with a decline was disapproval, risk, okay? So they could, they could see, I mean, it was still very accessible, but they could see the risk and then social disapproval came about. So if we look at the other uh, underlying factors, things like truancy, things like religiosity as a protective factor, uh, conventionality, it isn't as if over these uh, 10 or 12 years that the slope went down, that these uh, kids got religion or became more conventional. No, it was the proximate factors, okay? And those are amenable, <laughs> pardon me, um, can I get a glass of water <laughs> to prevention? Um, then um, what happened is you can see, well, then use went back up, I think to a disturbing level, not as bad as it was, and it sort of hung there. So what is that? Well, part of that's what's called generational forgetting. Remember, each one of these dots is a different class. And so by the time you got into 1992, they were no longer aware of the kids behind the gym who had smoked pot uh, earlier, and people began to forget. And then it's um, carried on at about five to 7% ever since. This is a huge concern for the field. There's a lot of worry because, as I would mentioned, there's lots of normalization of nor marijuana use, primarily through advertising. And is that going to leak down to these high school kids? Well, we hope not. <clears throat> Got to talk about alcohol. Um, the CDC averaged out over a period of uh, four years about 140,000 deaths per year attributed to alcohol. Some of it's 
due to accidents, things like that. Some of it's due to cirrhosis of the liver, you name it, the whole multitude of problems. Well, that's more than they're dying of uh, the uh, opioid overdose, uh, you know, still going on. Plus, it's associated with a whole series of problems, violence, still. Most instances of domestic abuse involve alcohol. Uh, look at sexual abuse on campus, okay, and consider that in most instances of sexual abuse on campus, both the perpetrator and the victim very often had been intoxicated, right? And without alcohol, there's a pretty good chance they may have behaved in with more wisdom or behaved better. Um, depression, suicide, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, a lot of that's trauma, which leads then to the next generation of, of problems. So alcohol is still a big one. And what I want to do is ref lots of ha has happened, by the way, we owe Mothers Against Drug Drivers a big debt of uh, gratitude. Um, I'd like to share something, and I think a lot of you observed this in Michigan. I was involved peripherally. Um, you may recall that not too long after voting age, by constitutional amendment went down to 18. Many states lowered the drinking age to 18. And one of the biggest <laughs> possible policy mistakes that could be made, because what happened then, remember uh, people in high school, there's a lot of 18 year olds in high school. So suddenly it was easier to get alcohol in high school. In addition to that, in that group 18, 19 and 20, it was just terrible what happened on the highways mainly. And so what happened is then advocates began to push to get the age back up. We have the data, this was a mistake. And so an organization called MICAP, Michigan Council on Alcohol Problems, um, tried to push the legislature into action. They wouldn't do it. They were pretty much in the pocket of the licensed beverage in, uh, industry, which was very happy to see the drinking age down there. So they put it on a, a constitutional referendum, and the voters voted uh, to increase the drink, the uh, uh, minimum legal drinking age. Um, now, here's my political philosophy. If a ballot referendum given to the people passes, and I agree with it, I say, democracy in action. The people have spoken. If it's something I disagree with, I'd say, well, once more, special interests have hijacked the legislative process, and here we go again. Uh, but anyway, this mattered, and then studies came up later that found that uh, persons who were uh, younger with a minimum drinking age in those states tended to have more alcohol problems later on. Measurably suicides, homicides, fatal traffic accidents, a whole range of problems. And what they were able to do, looking back at the surveys I mentioned, was to isolate binge drinking learned in the teen years as being really the factor that when teens would drink binge drinking more often, that predicted substance abuse problems in the future. So here's an example of how a public policy, a wise public policy, can have a favorable impact for the long term. And here's more good news for alcohol. Average teen binge drinking days per month, 2008 to 2017. So this is ages 12 through 20, okay? So the, and we see in 2008, the boys in the, I guess what, tan uh, column, declined quite a bit, as did the girls. And so I view this as a very positive and important development in terms of reducing substance abuse problems into the future. Oh, nicotine, oh my. Um, here's very good news. Again, it's not possible from where you're at to see the, uh, uh, the numbers, but uh, the red are the 12th graders, the blue are the 10th. We have that right, and then green are eighth graders. But the point is, look at the slope, okay? So the vertical access percent who you who uh, used in the last 30 days, horizontal access, 
is going back to 74 of uh, the percent we use now. This is so important because if people don't start smoking until after until after their teen years, if they if they don't start smoking as teens, chances are they won't start smoking. So that's terrific news. Still killing a lot of people, right? Um, uh, but that's lag data, you know, and, and I think that that will improve. Public policy help, but oh damn, that nicotine industry is clever. Some of the public policy that helped, and this occurred really in the 1990s after there were lawsuits and discovery taken from the tobacco companies where people found out, good God almighty, they were targeting teens the whole time. You know, and, and just all sorts of terrible things that they were doing. Um, after that, then practically no advertising. Indoor restrictions, which pushed smokers outside. Okay, stigma, but that encouraged them to quit and stop the secondhand smoke. Age went up to 21. So uh, a lot of those good things happened. You might be wondering what Buster what is his name? Buster Bronco um, is doing there. Well, some of you remember this. Big Tobacco was always trying to co-opt credibility with other entities. And in 2004, during the reign of Judith Bailey, lo and behold, Western Michigan University gave Employer of the Year Award to Philip Morris. And we looked at, oh, shit, why didn't they give it to El Trapo? You know, he killed fewer people. Um, now, vaping's the fly in the ointment, but that's beginning to turn around. It started with Juul, but there's other actors there. Juul's in trouble now um, because of their advertising. Their product was supposed to be aimed at adults giving up smoking. So where'd they advertise? Well, where do adults who want to give up smoking go? Nickelodeon. Right? Cartoon Network, do math practice tests. And here were some of their ads. Okay, look at the target. In here. In here. Okay, they did get in trouble for that. And things are beginning to turn around with the vaping, but that's not done. I don't know how easy it is for you to make this out, but here are vape. Vape highlighters, exactly. They're made to look like highlighters in school, so kids can go into school with their vape and hide it, okay? Oh, the four waves of the epidemic, and that is bad. From 96 to about 2010, it was pharmaceuticals, Purdue Pharma, more about them in a minute. Then from about 2010 to 2013, Mexican black tar heroin coming up cheap. 2014 to 18, mainly fentanyl. 2018 to now, well, it's still fentanyl, but often mixed with methamphetamine and other things. And this is my crude attempt to show, damn, the horse is out of the barn, and that then is a problem. So what happened? Because this didn't happen in any other country except, well, Canada somewhat, given their proximity. Well, let's look at the left side first. The supply side push. We have in our system a huge concentrated interest that happens to have a great deal of political power, pushing hard, okay? Purdue Pharma, um, NCs, but it wasn't just them. There were other pharmaceutical companies that joined in. Distribution networks, okay? I don't mean El Chapo, but I mean Kissing the, these mainstream distribution networks. And with the numbers they had, they had to know that they were distributing judge, drugs far in excess of what uh, was approved use. Pharmacy chains, CVS, you know, Walgreens, the whole. And then if there were the prescribers and the pill mills. So you had this concentrated push. And oh, if you're in business and you want a loyal customer, uh, people with opioid use disorders because they are good customers. There is a pull. You know, compulsive, do great many things to get the drug. So you got this huge profit 
generated push and this huge addiction pull. And what do we have in between? What we have in between is our regulatory and enforcement system, and it didn't work very well. So the FDA has been under a lot of criticism. Uh, then there's the DEA, and within the DEA, you have other entities that are involved in this, uh, on and on, and at the state level, State Board of Pharmacy, prosecutors, different levels. And so what happens is our regulatory system just isn't up to this. It's just too powerful. It took 15 years to begin to turn around the uh, prescription opioids. And some of the people like Keith Humphreys are saying, and this could happen again. Things haven't changed that much in this dynamic. One of the things that helped was discovery, just like with the tobacco company. So Purdue Pharma was sued and then there was discovery that came out, and this came out from the marketing people. And I'll just read a couple of lines. Their marketing people in 1995 went to various states to see, uh, you know, to do their, um, uh, what do you call it when a group of people get together who are custom focus group, focus group. And they did it with docs, and they found out that in the, quote, triplicate states, the docs were not very anxious to use their drug. Well, who are the triplicate states? There were five states beginning in the 70s that um, uh, came up with triplicate prescription requirements. In other words, there's three, the prescriber would fill it out, save a copy, give the patient two copies, the patient would give the pharmacy two copies, and the pharmacy would send the regulatory entity a copy. State Board of Pharmacy, or whoever's monitoring, that's the key, okay? Well, they, uh, Purdue Pharma didn't want any part of those states. In those states, four big ones uh, and a small one that made up about a third of the population. Well, researchers had been puzzled for a while before they saw this about the regional variations in opioid overdoses, and this began to explain a lot. So. Bear with me on this one. So again, the vertical axis, in this case, opioid overdose deaths. The horizontal axis begins with 1983, goes to 2017. The blue line are the triplicate states who already understood that they had some problem as part of the reason they're a triplicate state. But you can see, I don't know if the broken line shows up very well when Oxycontin was introduced, that uh, the blue states were ahead in opioid, blue states, the, the, the triplicate states were ahead in opioid overdoses, and the non-triplicate states were behind, but after Oxycontin and Purdue Pharma marketed, they switched in a short period of time. By 2004, the triplicate system was abandoned in favor of electronic ways of doing business. And you may recall that in 2010, the uh, whole issue of pharmaceuticals wasn't quite solved, but the pharmaceutical problem receded a great bit, and then it became heroin and then fentanyl driving it. So even though, uh, look at the blue line compared to the black line, the triplicate states to this day have far fewer uh, overdose deaths. Why is that? Because Purdue Pharma didn't go in their backyard and sow the seeds of this uh, continuing epidemic. So part of the lesson here is wise public policy can have lasting impact, okay? Oh, marijuana, here we go. Okay, marijuana commercialization. Okay, the first thing I wanna look at so that we have this commercialization going on with the marijuana industry very much downplaying its risks. Um, I have a table here with Ted's data Treatment episode data set. Whenever a uh, states apply for block grant funding from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, they have to send in their TEDS data, which among other things identifies what's the primary drug at the time of admission. Um, and in 2020, alcohol is number one. Not surprising. I think it's always been that way. Opiates elbowed its way to number two. Look at number three, marijuana. And I just bring this up to raise the question. Well, if marijuana is so benign, 
and doesn't have a risk potential, it's not addicting. What are people doing? Why is 10% of the admissions in a drug treatment program for marijuana, okay? And it's even ahead of meth and cocaine. So that's an issue. Part of it is this, THC is the primary, not exclusive, but it's the main active ingredient in marijuana. So for the marijuana confiscated, say up till the late 1990s, had less than 4% THC content. Now in 2020, and I think it's a bit higher now, the flower, the bud is 19%. The shake, 17%. That's the leaves and stems, I suppose. And there's all these different formulations of concentrate. When I looked at this, I, I recognize hash and hash oil, but there's other stuff, wax, shatter, whatever these things are. They have very strong concentrations of THC. It's a different drug, okay? I had mentioned there, as a freshman in college, I did a foolish thing, and I went to a party and drank a pint of gin with predictable results. Oh my God, I still look with horror at that. At that. Um, but the difference between 4% marijuana and the 67% is a difference between a pint of gin and a pint of beer. It's a different drug. Um, okay, another eye test, but you can see the slope. This goes for a very long time. The blue line are people, let's see if I can make it out. Um, thank you. And the red line are people 35 to 50, right? Okay. So you see these big increases. Now those are, uh, the horizontal axis again is daily use. And if you look at 22, for the population of the, the younger group, uh, 19 to 30, um, it's about at the level of the crispy critters back in the day, okay? Except now it's marijuana four times, 10 times more potent. So um, that should be a concern. And I wonder what the hell are these older people doing? Uh, for me, my God, I don't want to take anything that might mess with my memory, right? I mean, what the hell? Okay, so we have commercialization now in Michigan. And what I wanna do quickly is draw a distinction between decriminalization and legalization or commercialization. As occurred in Portugal, with decriminalization, the drug is still illegal. But possession under certain conditions, a certain amount then won't get you arrested. It won't get you with a criminal uh, record. Okay, so decriminalization in a lot of ways is very helpful. Unfortunately, with legalization and commercialization, what you have is a new big tobacco that comes in with money and advocacy and is working hard to normalize use. And I think there's, those are substantial risks. Um, one of the things that they said, like in 2018 in Michigan, is, well, we need to empty our prisons of people who... Um, are in there for possession of marijuana. When that question was put to Keith uh, Humphreys, he said, okay, eliminate all of our prisons with people in there for possession of marijuana. Let's find them, and then let's let both of them go, okay? Because it had been a good long time that that had happened, that people were, were put in prison for that. Let me present um, the... Uh, some alternatives we had. This is one of the things that the Cato Institute pointed to. Netherlands version of decriminalization. Well, it's still illegal, as it is throughout Europe. They have, they sell it through these very discreet uh, coffee shops, okay? And there, you're allowed to purchase up to five grams. That translates into five to 10 joints, okay? and on a population basis, the Netherlands cut down by about uh, a third what they had a couple decades ago of these licensed shops. And they did it because they observed that their admissions for marijuana use disorder and addiction 
was beginning to exceed the rest of Europe. So they tightened up as the Dutch sort of experiment and, uh, and all of that. So fewer dispensaries. In the Netherlands now, there is about one dispensary for every 10,000 individuals. In Michigan, no, I'm sorry, it's just the opposite. There's one for about every 30,000 residents. In Michigan, there's one for about every 10,000 residents. And it's growing, too. Um, in Netherlands, you're limited to five grams at a time. Uh, in Michigan, you can buy 71 grams. Why the hell anybody would need 71 grams? I don't know, but you can buy it. Here is the big one for me. No advertising. To me, that's the, that is the biggest concern of how advertising can push to normalizing. Um, and then Uruguay, that was another one brought up by uh, the Cato Institute. Yeah, Uruguay legalized marijuana. They did it in a way different way than Michigan. In, uh, in Uruguay, the whole supply chain, beginning to end, including the stores, is run by the government, okay? And so their stores are something like, you know the ABC stores in the South, if you've, you've seen those places where the government is essentially, uh, well, that's what they have in Uruguay. No advertising. They don't have a commercial interest trying to normalize or increase use, okay? So, I wish we'd have done it differently, but. Okay, harm reduction, services to support staying alive. If we had a soundtrack, we would hear the Bee Gees right now, okay? But staying alive during active drug use. Um, it's distinct from treatment, and it's become pressing with all of the overdose deaths that we're seeing. We've had more people now uh, die uh, in this epidemic than died during the whole AIDS epidemic. Right, I mean, it, it real hundred thousand plus per year, that we hope it's leveling off and decreasing. We'll see. Now there are some uh, things that have low risk, high rewards that I get back behind a hundred percent. Safe accessories, needle exchange, syringes, give people safe supplies, test strips. Let them see how much fentanyl is in their. Uh, is in the drugs they're purchasing. In Narcan, okay, um, I ride my bike a lot, Kalamazoo, in pre-pandemic, there are a couple times when I noticed people, well, you see people sleeping in the unlikeliest places now in Kalamazoo, but I saw people sleeping, one guy actually had his foot over the curb, and at another time, somebody right on the sidewalk. So what I did, thinking, oh, Lord, was to rouse them, you know, and, and they woke up and they were fine and they didn't want an ambulance or, or didn't want help. Uh, but now when I bike and go around, I take Narcan, Narcan, just in case, right? Because that can help reverse if it is a, a opiate. And then now there are phone lines for loners, okay? Um, most opioid users want to use a loan. And if you picture the idea of somebody using and then they nod out, it's this private thing. It's not a social thing. It's private with them doing something with their central nervous system. So they don't want to be in a group when they do it. But the advice is don't use a loan. So in California, there's a public phone line. There's some private phone lines that people can call give the number of somebody nearby who's a friend, and then the phone line will call after they use, and if they're awake, that's fine. If they don't answer the phone, the phone line will call the friend to get over with some Narcan and uh, see, see what they can do. This is, I think, terrific. Then there are methods to save lives and connect to treatment if or ever the client's ready. In my opinion, before we do many of these, in a community, um, we should remove the financial barriers to effective treatment. Because there is methadone, which has been used quite successfully for over 50 years. There's buprenorphine that's been, that's been around for several decades. 
um, both of these drugs with slightly different actions um, will, when the dose is adjusted appropriately, um, eliminate the craving to use. And with the right dose, blunt the effects of the drug should somebody take an opiate. There aren't any good for drugs other than opiates, but, but wonderful. And in my opinion, what in the hell would we want to do at least in a community where we can't refer people to effective treatment? Um, one are safe consumption sites. Okay, so, you know, I have a Dutch heritage, so I point to the Netherlands as the people who do things right, okay? And the, the Dutch model is not controversial. In America, it's fraud. Uh, it is controversial. And I think the difference is this. Um, in the Netherlands, they're concerned about ambiance, okay? And so when they see people with addictive disorders who are behaving in ways that are disordered in public, they want to shoo them somewhere and get them the hell off the sidewalk. So they'll send them to these safe consumption centers. In America, it hasn't worked out so good because when they've come up with safe consumption centers, as one that closed down earlier in the tenderloin of San Francisco, um, the people behave in ways that are disordered around the consumption sites. And so people operating stores or whatever in the neighborhood complain. So somehow, if we're gonna do that, we gotta work that out. National Institute on Drug Abuse is studying them to evaluate them, and we'll see. Okay, and this is my last slide. The whole issue of safe supply, as I mentioned in Canada, okay? This is kind of the ultimate in the oh to hell with it approach, okay? And that's to give people drugs that if they use, so you give a heroin addict heroin, they're gonna, uh, it lasts four to six hours. They go up, they go down, they go up, they go down, up and down in the course of a day. They can't be part of the community under those conditions. You give them fentanyl, even shorter duration of action. You can't be part of the community with that profile. Uh, Aristotle would not approve of this approach. Okay, so in Vancouver, somebody did a study. So Vancouver, British Columbia is sort of like Oregon, right? And their uh, support for drug use. And there was a house that this one researcher looked at that housed about 20 guys. And it had the full money, supportive housing. Okay, supportive housing is good. We don't want, want people uh, you know, living in a ditch. But there was also a supervised consumption site you get your free needles and whatever, and to round it off a safe supply. And come to find out, I don't think it was so safe because residents prefer to use alone. So people would not want to use in the, um, um, in the uh, supervised consumption area. They want to go to their rooms on their own with that risk and, and take the drugs. And so when you put all of this together and you have people with addiction disorders living uh, in such a way that they can get the drug, their housing's taken care of, the food's taken care of. Um, they don't have to be distracted by things like preparing to learn how to go to work or going to work. They can pretty much focus on their drug use. Um, again, they can't function in the community and if the idea is to wait until they're ready for treatment, it's going to be a very, very long wait for people living under those conditions. So kind of closing on a downer, and I do want to remind people that when we look at the big ones, the big killers, alcohol and nicotine in particular, there is lots to celebrate and lots, lots of good news. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions, comments, uh, opinions. Thanks, Andy. Just a comment and a question. Comment, when I was in the Netherlands in the spring, I 
I was curious because I know it was decriminalized, but on the streets in, in, in the Netherlands, as you walk around, you don't see any um, obvious drug users or people lying around or anything um, as, as you um, as you commented. And I was I was just struck by that. And in Belgium, our, our guide said, well, um, and I asked him where people were who were um, in, in that situation. He said, well, we have changed a lot of our prison room into drug rehab. Oh, great. And um, then I, my question is for you, what about the Kalamazoo camps? Where is there, there is the no harm um, policy and drugs are provided to people. Is this really helping people? Well, in a couple of comments about the camps. I don't know a whole lot. I'm not that plugged in the community, but from what I've read, I'm really impressed by what uh, Integrated Services does with the county mental health and substance abuse. I think they're reaching out and doing it in the right way. I know that the uh, Stryker School of Medicine sends people out to do health checkups. I think those are commendable things. But when you talk about the camps, don't get me going. One of the times, you know, I'm proud to be from Kalamazoo. And I was so disheartened at the Ampersee camp. Because there you had people living in squalor, living in mud. And by the way, adjacent to an African-American neighborhood that wouldn't have happened on the west side. But anyway, you had that. You had advocates supporting them staying there, okay? And the message I thought from the community to that group, until I think the city had done a better job of um, clearing them out and getting them into shelters, was this is your place in the community. This is who you are. You're in the mud in the tent, and we're going to support you being in the mud in the tent. I found it as terribly disheartening. I'd mentioned, Michael, my parents are from the Netherlands, and I think of my grandmother, and I think of visits there. And I think, what if somebody went to Hilversum, where my grandmother's from, and tried to put up tents, you know, up in the public spaces, and people then giving them food and enabling them when there were shelter beds ready. And I can just hear my grandmother, oh, my gender, you know. They they wouldn't they wouldn't put up with that. But I think it's it's out of love, right? That they don't allow people, and they certainly wouldn't support people to find that niche in the community. So anyway, thank you for the question. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about alcohol. It seems to me that's an especially uh, difficult uh, problem because to many people, alcohol is a beverage and it's used to relax and enjoy one another's company. It's often social. But for alcoholics, for alcoholics, it's not a beverage, it's a drug. Exactly. And the way we try to confront that becomes much more difficult because of, of social norms. Can you speak a little bit more about that, please? I Thank you. I appreciate your distinction because I think you nailed it. So alcohol is both of these things at once, okay? It's the beverage, and I've been paying attention. Who's drinking wine? You know, it's the beverage that people enjoy with a meal and maybe at a second drink, a little bit of a social lubricant, but that's it. That's alcohol, the beverage. Then you have alcohol, the drug, which was what I did as a freshman with gin. Okay, no, you, and that is something completely different, right? And so um, I think then the, the push and pull, part of it is, uh, recognizing the power of the licensed beverage industry, I have much more respect for them than I do the nicotine people or, as you could guess, the marijuana people, because there are 
majority of people can use safely, and it's okay. But nevertheless, it's uh, people with alcohol use disorders are consuming. They may make up maybe 10% of the population, but that's half of their business, right? And so there is that tension. Um, and so that's why I think the licensed beverage industry lined up against, and I still can't figure it out, raising the age back up to 21 when there were all these, these problems. So there is that, there is that tension of alcohol. And it's tough. It's tough to resolve. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, um, that's, there are risk factors, I, which I didn't really talk about. I was kind of pushing the proximate factors. But there are risk factors, certainly for alcohol, uh, most pronounced. And they go in a couple different directions. So risk factors for alcohol, uh, one big one is growing up uh, with parents who are abusing alcohol. So when people grow up under those circumstances, it seems normal. Well, then you can add to that, there are people who respond to alcohol differently for genetic reasons, um, who when they drink and become intoxicated for the rest of their life, they can tell you, well, the first time, I'll never forget the first time, you know, that I got uh, a buzz and it was just so wonderful. Well, most people don't react that way, right? So there's that genetic risk. And also, there is a third, there's a protective risk. Okay, so that what we're finding out is there are um, some people of Jewish heritage. This is coming out of studies in Israel. In addition to that, um, uh, there are people, uh, Asian people, who have a gene that is protective in this sense. It has to do with the development of alcohol dehydrogenase, which is part of the cycle for um, uh, metabolizing alcohol. So people with, that, there's a couple different variations of that. But people who have those genes, um, Asian and some Jewish people in Israel, um, they have a drink or two, and that's all they can have because they begin to develop a headache or get sick. and is that a handicap? I'd say that's protective, right? So the genes can work both ways. So I, uh, I just... I'll make it very short. Around 19, I think it was around 1995, Dr. Content came about from Purdue. And simultaneously, not too long after that, we got this letter from AMA that insisted on treating the patients for pain. Oh, yeah. If you don't, you can be sued by the patient because I made them suffer. So here, this potent duality, one comes, OxyContin, which is very potent. So at this report, in this uh, rep, very massive rep company, for you have, they come to the office, and they claim this is not addictive. This is not as addictive as you think. So, because we're all concerned, obviously. No, I give it to my patient. I see patients say, oh, I see a spider on that corner. Oh, I see this. I see, I see the animals coming in there, kill me. I tell you, my, uh, personally, in spite of doing these major surgeries, which you have to cut the sternum, and you know, very painful. I personally, did not use this, this drug more than a couple times at the beginning. Because they immediately recognized this is not really needed for this patient. All they need is just a lesser, like Percocet, supposedly, or go quickly to Tylenol with codeine, and that would be as effective. How many patients received with the arthritis this medicine and became addicted? So part of it has to do with this company that you mentioned, Purdue, and similar. A part has to do with my colleagues who were fooled, or perhaps some were pushed by this drug company, giving them incentive to keep on writing these prescriptions. Well, just 
to answer just a couple quick comments. Um, there was this period of time when pain was uh, considered one of the things, you know, that you had to treat. And it included joint commission on accreditation. Joint commission was rating hospitals on how effectively they treated pain and how aggressively they did. And a lot of that was based on, wasn't really a study. It was a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine that highlighted a study done inpatient, no outpatient, that said that inpatient people who received high doses of narcotics didn't become addicted. Well, how would they know if that was just inpatient? So what then Purdue did was go out and say, if pain is present, you can't get addicted. And they sold that. So I'm glad they didn't sell you. So thank you. Thank you, thank you.